What's up, everyone? Uh, this is Moonlight Rose. I haven't been streaming for a million years, but I'm actually streaming right now, and hopefully I'll be streaming every Friday from here on out, except for when I'll be busy. So for this first stream, I'll be doing basically what I did with Roy a little while back, where where I went through how I made how we made Oasis. This except this time around, I'll be going through Volcano. A bit of a lesser known track, but one I'm super proud of. And if you don't know which track that is, uh, that's all you need to know. <laughs> Either way, I'll probably be going into a lot more detail about how I made the different bases and mixing decisions in this one. Partly because I don't think there's a lot I'll be reusing in this, while a lot in Oasis might be reused further down along the road, so I'm, so I'm okay with you just straight up stealing shit from this one and also just because a lot of it a lot of the arrangement of it has more to do with the specific sounds i used oasis was really really a uh, symbol in that sense but with that being said let's start from the beginning in the beginning there was a beginning it was a pretty short one By the way, I'll be stopping and starting a lot throughout this entire thing. So if this is your first time listening to this track, this is gonna be a terrible first this is gonna be a terrible way to hear it for the first time. So go ahead and listen to it. Uh, in the YouTube version, I'll probably put a link in the description of it, but if you're watching on Twitch right now, like just search for it on SoundCloud. Moonlight Rose Volcano. You'll probably find it. And also, this is the 2018 version, so there's a few different things in it, but I opened this version because I like it that little bit more. But either way, uh, this whole track starts off with this fun little sound. That basically fits together with this one. And the reason I, I put this was, like, Volcano, I instantly knew what kind of theme I was going for with this, so I just try to make it sound like a volcano like rumbly and sorry about that rumbly and all that kind of stuff and when it comes to most of the elements here in the intro uh they're very subdued and very subtle i made this intro before not before after i made the drop so i knew what i was leading into and i've been listening to a lot of bad computer <laughs> at this point uh like holy shit he's so fucking good but yeah, I I very easily picked up on the fact that when you have a pretty minimal drop, like what I have here, you can't really go all that overboard in the intro and build-up. So a lot of it is just supposed to build suspense, pretty much. We have some strings. They're coming in a little later. Let me see if I can find the exact thing we're starting with. It's this armor patch. Turn on my keyboard. I was super prepared for this. I don't know if it can be heard over me, but there is a very, very low pitched, very subtle, like pulsating almost plug with a little bit of movement in it. Very interesting, I know. Let me see if I can see where exactly the movement comes from. I don't quite remember actually. But yeah, there's... Oh, it's, it's from this. I've automated uh, the face on this. With just a little bit of a unison on it. It's a sub plug. It just gives it some movement, so it moves from like the fully sub-region into the low base region and stuff like that. It, uh, in general, if you want pretty cool sounds uh, in armor, just go onto Hertz mode and 
turn the lowest part of harmonic use and pitch completely off. And mess around with the face here. Because you'll you'll get a lot of really cool like comb style sounds out of it. And that's a lot of what I'm doing here. I feel no mod. <laughs> I'll make sure to turn you into a mod real quick, Roy. If I can. Let me see. Uh, Streamlabs is being stupid. I mean, I'll, I'll do that at a bit of a later time. But yeah, just to begin with, I have basically that and a long ass uh, ambient drone going on here. I know, a lot of people would probably be like, how how do you get ambience into sounds? And a lot of people will be, will be like, just put a lot of reverb on sounds. You can be lazier than that. You can just have fucking samples of ambience. It's it's not a game. You you can cheat like that if you want, and that's what I did here. I think I have something else going on as well. Oh yeah, I have uh, some strings going on. I'm not even really sure where they are because they're so quiet. It's just there because I like strings and they, uh, they gave a little more texture here. So, that was basically the entire intro. Right after that we get right into the build-up where I have... These plugs will come back later. And I, I have... Not really a lot else than just a riser. I think it's a kind of acid-like riser here. And uh, snares and just and just teasing. Oh my god, my computer is freaking out. <laughs> I'm just teasing the elements that are gonna come later on. I'm teasing the bass and the beep beep and stuff like that. And this is just more reverbed elements. It's practically just saw waves with the, not saw waves, square waves. Uh, the quiet melodies are these these patterns that have a fuck ton of reverb on them. As you can see here, I don't think it's that one, actually. Yeah, it's, it's this one. With a lot of reverb and some parametric EQ. Where it's just so quiet that you can't even... You can't even fucking see the line because I've turned it down so much here. I just went straight on, like, full reverb. As you can see... The mix is 100%. The decay is longer than longer than my semester, and everything else is just really fucking long. <laughs> oh boy, shit. But yeah, after that, like, this might seem like a really underwhelming build-up in comparison to infinite decay almost, yeah? It might seem like an underwhelming build-up in comparison to what one might be used to from other EDM tracks or uh, other my tracks in general. That's just because the drop itself is extremely minimal and uses a lot of silence in it. Uh, there might be a lot of like syncopation and stuff in it, but energy-wise, it is close to close to the bottom. So I I couldn't really build up all that much energy in both the intro and build up. It just mostly builds suspense more than anything else. But yeah, let's get into the drop here now. Pay close attention to that pattern I've got going on there. Boom, ba dum beep, beep. 
I know that a lot of people uh, might see Complexro as this really, again, it's in the name complex genre, but a lot of it just comes down to groove, as far as I've noticed, and this is basically a bit of deconstruction of Complexro in general. It's got all the elements of it, but it's very minimal and it's, it's not as bombastic as Complexro usually is. That happens in the second drop. But uh, the way I usually tackle Complexro, and the way a lot of people tackle Complexro who have done it for a long time, is that they tend to use like phrases. They tend to make a pattern and just repeat that. And then the way they make things sound interesting is that they add some uh, other elements to it along the way. <laughs> Sidechain with automation clips. Ah. You get cleaner results out of it than you might realize. It's pretty cool, actually. But yeah, the main pattern I've got going on is practically the one that you get uh, introduced to right in the beginning. It's this practically filler sound. If it wants to. I think there's something stupid happening here. Yeah, okay, there we go. And now the sidechain is being... Is this the sub? That is the sub. But yeah, uh, the first sound we've got going on here, this might be the lesser interesting one. <laughs> it's serum effects is okay as well. But this one is practically just my attempt at being bad computer with a little more neuro in it, a little more detuned. Uh, it's basically just a saw wave with a little bit of square wave in it, not a lot. And then it's detuned to all hell, both here, as you can see, the detune is a little bit down from what it would be normally. Oh, there's no bit crusher on the sub. And then I've got a little bit of unison going on, just again, to make it a little more noisy and adding a little more detune to it. And, uh... When I've got it uh, at this exact phase here, what I usually end up is, with is a kind of sharp attack, which I think comes from everything being technically in phase to begin with, and then spreading out and causing some uh, negative interference, which makes it a little quieter. And then I just kind of attenuate that sharp attack. You might not hear it normally, with all the sidechain on it, but that attack helps a lot with keeping the rhythm and keeping the groove of it. So there's a bit of uh, low pass on it. I'm actually automating the pitch of it. Do that a lot if you want a sharp attack on what you're doing. It's so cool. It can be used on kicks, subs, uh, plugs, obviously plugs, leads, all that kind of stuff. It's a great little trick. And yeah, I think that's practical what I'm doing. And then I'm just distorting the shit out of it. It could be the stream, yeah. And now, with all the detune that's going on and all the interference, this is practically uh, unpredictable as all shit in its current version. So I am uh, multiband compressing the fuck out of it afterwards. If I were to turn that off. It sounds a lot less uh, solid now. And that's kind of a bummer when it's filling so much of the track. I'm distorting it a little bit. Uh, I tend to do this kind of distortion a lot. It's basically just soft clipping the peaks. I don't go for full-on distortion most of the time, but this just helps with making mixing a little bit easier. And just messing with the EQ. So that's the main filler sound. And then we've got the beep beeps. Which are not playing. 
Now they're just filtered. Wonderful. Sure, we'll keep them that quiet. Actually, no. There we go, that's acceptable. So what you might have heard there already is that this is actually a layer of two different sounds. One of the very, very few layers I've got going on. So here is the beep. That's Sandstorm for you. And uh, here we have the underlying bass. It's just a standard massive patch. Uh, the beep itself is practically just a square wave transposed up to a fifth and then with an underlying uh, saw wave that's transposed pretty far down to give it that little bit of extra bite and I think, yeah, they're comp not compressed, distorted together. And then we've got the massive patch here. I could try to explain what I did here, but I would just come up short. Uh, usually when I mess around with Massive, I have no fucking clue what I'm doing when it comes to uh, the wavetables I use. The only thing I can really explain is the last one. Where I took a... Uh, I took a... I think at this point it's, a, it's just straight up a saw wave. I bended it a little bit and I'm messing around with that with an LFO and then I uh, phase modulated it by quite a bit. I don't know what this exactly is. I think this is just adding that exact same pitch automation that I talked about with the other sound. But in general just mess around with wavetables I'd say. Uh, Try to try to modulate as much as you can and just find out what works best. And when it comes to uh, filters, don't experiment at all. Double notch and all pass or band pass. That's all you need. And then you can make any bass you want. I'm kidding, of course, but that's what I used here to make those work. And the resonance is pretty low on this, but I usually have it a lot higher on other massive basses. I'll probably get more into that later on. But yeah, they played together and they didn't have they didn't have reverb on them before, but they have in the 2018 version. That's the first bit of uh, of alternation we've got happening. This is basically close to the same bass as before, but with a very long attack to it. I don't know where I have that attack, but there's a long attack to it. And it's just... As I go on, I'm adding more and more elements to it. Starting with that lead and bass. And then this little boy. It's just from a sample pack. If that thing wanted to cooperate, it doesn't. Very, very quiet now. It's just a ping with a lot of reverb on it. Like, when you sidechain things this much, you can add basically whatever the fuck you please and it's gonna sound at least somewhat cool. Little vocal drone going on there. That bass going on there. It sounds weird here, but basically it's just a seamless bass. Uh, I took the thing I've got. That's the sub. <laughs> I took this thing here again, made another patch, and I just made it more solid. I removed the low pass. I 
As far as I can see, I'd completely just drag things over to the other side and messed around with. With a lot of shit here. Just to make it sound weird. Distorted the fuck out of it. And then the way that this thing modulates like that is because of EQ uh, modulation going on. If we play the actual thing here, then the weird automation you see going on is just... Uh, I, I think the usual stack that Seamless makes is one uh, band pass and a fuck ton of notches. I tend to just go for two. <laughs> And it, there it's having a little more fun afterwards, it's actually not doing anything. I think I use it later on as well. Not exactly sure where. So there's a lot of things getting added here afterwards. Uh, starting with one extra lasting element. I hate the fact that it doesn't play. <laughs> There we go. It's the exact same fucking patch. Uh, exact, exact same neuro patch. Uh, this time the sub is interesting because I made it a little more pluggy, as you can see going, as you can see in the volume here. It starts off solid and then very quickly goes down. Sometimes just messing with the sub yields fun results. But that's, again, a layer, as far as I can see. Very, very subtle layer, because I have this uh, plug doing basically this thing. And then I have this extra little sound coming in, which is the exact same thing, but squared, just to give it a little more ambiguity in what's going on. Since, again, it's all about the groove at this point. And yeah, that little that's happening every time I start the, the thing. That's just from the FLP being so enormous. I can't really do a lot about it. But yeah, that's not the only fun thing getting added here. We have this fun little ambient element. If you're keen, you might have noticed that it's practically just like a 303 slash acid sound and that's happening in massive through just using the formant filter uh, it sounds weird without a lot of reverb on it but with all the reverb on it that it gets from Valhalla Shimmer it just it's ambient and it sounds cool And I, I think a lot of what's happening when it comes to all of the other elements, again, it's it's the exact same thing. Repetition, you can you can get away with a lot of repetition if you continue adding elements on top of it. It happens in a lot of complex tracks. <laughs> Fucking computer, shut up. Oh yeah, there's this sound as well. Which doesn't play. Of course it doesn't. <laughs> Fucking. Now that's a bit more aggressive. And you can see part of where it gets that aggressive nature from is the slightly higher resonance here. And just pulling the uh, double notches a bit higher. And then just in general as well I've... Uh, the EQ is a little less uh, it, it, it's a little less like scooping out where all the presence is and just being kind of flat a lot of this might look a little random and weird but it's just from a lot of experimenting and as you can see here I'm basically using the exact same uh, patch set up again but I'm fiddling around with things to make them sound slightly different. 
I'm not even using white noise. I usually use white noise. I, I don't know. But yeah, just random elements going on here. A lot of the silences that come in here and there, uh, there's not really a reason or rhyme to them. It's mostly just experimenting with where does it sound cool for everything to drop out. Because yeah, you can have you you can have a song that's full of elements, but sometimes just silence in itself can be a really cool element. Uh, look at it like this: you you can add as much as you want. You can go like up to the top of everything. You can have it completely peaking at zero dB as much as you want. At that point, though, no matter how much more you add, you've you've basically reached the top. It's not going to sound interesting. Something that will sound interesting at that point, though, is... <laughs> no, it's not sidechained. It's, there's just delay on it. But at that point, uh, just cutting everything out, it basically reminds you of how much, bit, how much has been added. It, it, uh, it takes you by surprise, and it makes you suddenly pay a little more attention. So that's really good for when you add new elements, like the lead I'm adding here, which again does not want to play because it's an ass ad. If we remove all of the delicious reverb on it, it's just a super saw with a little bit of vibrato to it. <laughs> yes, Atrus, exactly. 433 bass boosted. Why not? That's going on there as the new added element. And because we're reaching the end of it, uh, I'm doing what I like to do sometimes in drops. I talked about it as well in Oasis. Just kind of making the last bit of drop a bit of a build-up on its own by having elements slowly rising. I don't know if you can hear it here. I think it's... It's very subtly just rising here. I don't know if there's something I went wrong, but yeah, it's it's supposed to just slowly uh, rise in energy and, and intention because it makes you it makes you uh, focused on what's coming afterwards. Here is a direct buildup, direct riser. sounds crunchy right now. <laughs> and yeah, I use uh, Toxic Biohazard for a lot of my risers, but a lot of it is just like FMing. I'm FMing the shit out of this one and just raising the pitch of uh, the modulator. Delicious word, modulator. That's what's going on there. The mentality behind it is just that, like, you're paying attention to what's coming next. And, like, sometimes it, it doesn't have to be... That's a lit riser, I know, right? <laughs> it doesn't have to be, like, a new interesting big drop. Sometimes it it's just, like, a new section. And the new section that's coming here is uh, basically the big lead up to the second drop. But yeah, just just before we get to that... Let's talk about a few of the other elements that are getting added. Let's see if I can find it. This is just an art because I uh, I sent this in for feedback at some point to some people, and they suggested why not add a few more things, maybe like an arp or something. So I added a, an arp that I drenched in reverb. It plays once without uh, being heard at all, as you can see from the automation going on here. And that's just a feed into the reverb that's on it. So when it whooshes in, it sounds like it's already drenched. 
It was very short, but like if I remove the reverb, it just sounds 8-bit like. But with the reverb on, it just it makes it sound like it it doesn't even like feel like an, an arm. It just feels like sudden a, a sudden whoosh of sound. I do that a lot if I want to add a bit more ambience to what I'm doing. And afterwards, it's just playing a kind of shorter, uh, a little longer notes, so it's not exactly an arp at this point. But I think that's more or less all of the elements going on here. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm adding hats as well. Uh, the first bit of it has no hats at all. And as you've gotten more or less comfortable with the whole thing, I add the hats in. Just a very standard pattern where I'm accentuating every offbeat with a super loud open hi-hat. Uh, if you can, when you're making minimal drops or just uh, any drop that's not full straight on to begin with, if you can get away with not adding the hats in to begin with, uh, you're basically setting up for al already being able to extend that drop a lot more. Uh, because adding hats on top of this just instantly adds a little more movement and a little more character. But having the hats to begin with, that just makes you used to them right away. Like you, you don't even really hear the hats because of everything else that's going on, but they just add a little bit. <laughs> Exact same patch. I've messed a bit around with uh, the pitches and everything, and I gave it a fun little phrase to play. But yeah, it's practically reusing the same patch over and over again. But yeah, after all of that lead up and that drop being fun and all that stuff, uh, we get to the long ass build up to the next part. That right there is just the same uh, melody that's going on here. Uh, the whole reason why I'm even using that melody all that much is practically a callback to Meteorite, where I did the exact same thing. It's about teasing the melody before it comes in full force, because then it's kind of in the back of your head. You've kind of heard it before, it kind of fits with everything else. And then when it comes in, it just feels like a good moment. You, you sit there and you're like, ah. There it is. I hate that sound. <laughs> but ju just like, if you can in some way tease a melody in, it doesn't even have to be through drenching it in reverb. It can be through just giving a few phrases of it or having it be played in a lower register in some way where it's maybe not as noticeable. Just anything to tease a melody before it comes in. Uh... You get an A in my book, if you do stuff like that. Just a lot of ambience going on as well. And there we have the melody. It sounds a little glitchy because there's some bit crushing on it. Uh, I'm using a factor for that because that's the big crush I had at that point. Fruity Squeeze sucks, so don't ever use that if you can get away with it. Uh, what's going on down here is I just have the strings from before, these bad boys. They're very, very quiet with a bit of reverb on them. The highs blown out to shit. Turn up the dy dynamics.
Like, yeah, they're not a herd, per se, among everything else. But they just, they're adding a, an extra layer, mostly in the high end, of just not pure uh, electronic elements. It adds a little more depth to it, I think. These are just super sauce. Some high pass. And then there's a bit of a face around them. Which makes them constantly feel like they're rising a little bit. You can maybe see it happening here. So they're working like a bit of a perpetual, like, barbershop pole-esque riser. I think there's a name for that effect, but it, I've, I've forgotten it right now. But yeah, uh, risers and everything going on here until we get to the euphoric part of this build-up. <laughs> That my computer absolutely hates. Wonderful. Let's ease into it then. I'm just slowly raising the low pass on the super on the plucks while I'm going on by the way but yeah uh, the triumphant last return of the Mune piano for a long ass time right here this is where things start to die yeah <laughs> uh, it's just Alicia's keys that's what I use for everything and the way I get the sound that I usually get is through, and you're gonna hate me for this, just racing the highs to shit. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of reverb on them. The reverb is before the compression here, which is very aggressive. It's just to get that sort of Porter Robinson-esque uh, attack on it. And then... This might look intense, but yeah, there, there's distortion on the piano, and this might look intense, but really, uh, the pianos only peak at like this point here. So what I'm doing is that I'm basically just racing the level of it after everything else I've done. I could do that in Pro C, but I'm a lazy ass, and I am clipping it a little bit here, uh, just just so it doesn't have too much of an attack because it ended up sounding flimsy when it had that much attack but yeah after that i'm i'm pretty sure this is just a turn off the sound of it afterwards because there's a lot of reverb on it i actually got some flack uh from, <laughs> from levia okay maybe not exactly from levia but uh i sent the stems for this to levia for uh for the lights to, re to remix it that's also a really fucking good remix by the way if i showed a uh, work in progress of that remix and people said that like why why is the piano distorting in that one and everything and like the piano was originally distorting in my version you just don't hear it because it's so layered uh so don't be afraid of distorting things just a little bit as long as you make sure that you're not distorting everything at once. I hate my computer. This is just a uh, dirty saw wave kind of thing. Where there's a little bit of uh, modulation going on to make it sound somewhat interesting. And then some uh, noise. And just distort it afterwards. It's a very standard kind of, uh, very symbol layer. <laughs> yeah, go go ahead and do that, Atreus. Uh, you might notice that I'm not low passing. I'm not high passing this one. How come? Like, I usually tell people to high-pass this kind of stuff. Uh, the reason why I usually tell people to high-pass stuff 
is because the low end tends to get really muddy and complicated because you have a lot of people tend to have a lot of really modulated sounds in the low end. This is straight up just a saw wave. It's so solid in the low end that I'd say you can get away with this one. I at least decided to go with this one like it is. And also just like I don't have I don't need a solid a low end in just a breakdown slash build up as I usually do during drops. Oh man, we're not even halfway through this section. <laughs> Okay, claps. There is no real reason for there to be claps here, but I'm just having them in here because they add a little more high-end interesting stuff, and they carry the rhythm of what's going on as well. Okay, so if if you uh, if you ignore the fact that my computer is about to combust into flames, uh, you might have noticed that the bass is playing a kind of polyrhythm to the snare, which, by the way, has some reverb on it. <laughs> I hated the underruns, but yeah, just sometimes. Uh, making things play together like that yields interesting results when it comes to the groove of it. The more I keep using my computer, the more this is going into the 110 BPM. Exactly. Uh, this is practically everything that has been happening so far solidified into one, uh, one continuous chord while the snare is basically taking care of uh, the buildup risers and everything happening as well. And then after that we get to the really fun part. Oh yeah, also I have the kicks coming in. Uh, a little quieter than usual. Not with a lot of, not with any sidechain on anything else going on here. Uh, it's a lie that you need to sidechain super hard whenever the kick or snare comes in. You need to do that if you're pushing for as loud as possible. So if you're in a breakdown or something like that, you can get away with just not sidechaining things. There was a little bit of glitching going on there that actually wasn't because of the computer. It was because of grow speed. The master here. Let's see if we can get to it. I just take the preset. There it was. That preset right there. I'm using it again afterwards, as far as I can see. But yeah, that that's just to like trip to let people know at that point that like oh things are about to get a little bit dirty things are about to get a little fun and glitchy and complex bro. also low end rumble because volcano so the very first uh, fun dirty sound that you get to hear is a uh, is a super fun kind of glitchy robotic esque massive sound here <laughs> it doesn't sound all that impressive right here but uh, the if I can find it here here it is yeah the automation on it is what makes it interesting because unlike most automation on a lot of other bases it's not really all that uh, smooth it's jumping between every step 
that's that's a very easy way to make anything sound robotic. It's just make it jump in steps between things. <laughs> And it's not it's not exactly perfect though, because Massive is a bitch and it has some smoothing going on that I didn't turn off. So whatever. So, how do you start such a complex drop as this one? How do you make it as explosive as possible? Uh after such Yeah, there is a little bit of smoothing. But how do you make a drop sound as explosive and big as possible after such an enormous build-up. Well, the first thing you do is again, with a bit of silence, or maybe not silence, but just a very simple sound to begin with. Uh, right there to begin with, let me see if I can find it. I'm keeping a lot of it in the same pattern here, by the way, because I'm an idiot. Uh, I hate the sidechain. There we go. That's just a single saw wave. I think it's the exact same one. Okay, not exactly the exact same one, but it's the exact same concept. A saw wave, white noise, distortion. Again, no, uh, no separate sub on this one. No high pass because it's a really solid and simple sound and it's playing on its own. So. After that, though, we get to the really fun stuff. Did I accidentally turn off the sub? <laughs> I think I accidentally made a lot of really weird decisions. <laughs> because it sounds fucking weird. Let me try opening it again. Uh, let's go to an interlude while I try to fix things. Okay, we're back. I unfucked this whole thing. So let's actually get into what, what I was supposed to talk about. So again, I'm going in with the exact same mentality as I went in as I did when I went in, into the first drop and the exact same mentality I use whenever I go into any kind of complex row which is phrases and groove. So the first part of it is uh, the first idea I had to begin with of what I wanted to do with the whole thing, which was just a downward descending... Uh, let me make sure the sidechain is turned off this time around. There we go. Uh, a downward descending, like, really pluggy yet super aggressive saw wave. It might not sound like a saw wave, but that's what it started off being. Let me see if I can find it. Should be this one yet. That's a sub. 
Fuck you, sub. <laughs> I'll find it eventually. I'll get to it. There it is. Oh, that, that's a layer I have on top of it. God damn it. I should have cleaned this thing up before. So that's the sound we're going with here. It's a armor patch. It's practically just a saw wave. There's a little fun with the harmonic levels going on here, but it's practically still a saw wave. And most of what's happening just here is just that it's, it's plucking. And again, I'm doing the same thing with the Hertz mode and no, uh, no harmonic unison on the fundamental and just messing around with the phase here. It yields fun results. That sounds fun. So what, what makes it sound so interesting and big, I'd say, is the filter going on here. It's very simple, but it make it has a huge impact on it because I am multiband distorting the shit out of it. <laughs> then I have a little bit of reverb on it because it was extremely dry at that point. A little bit of EQing, and then just a lot of distortion on the sound. On on basses, distor distortion can be super fun. But that's not all that's happening there. Uh, like I was talking about, I have a uh, a layer on top of it. And this might sound weird, but this layer is practically the beep beep from before. I'm a sheep. Uh, but with a little bit of dirtying up. It's got, the, it's got some pluck to it now. Uh, I don't know what else I'm doing. I'm doing a little bit of prism to mess with the harmonics. Uh, a little bit of pitch automation, I did that before. And I think the big fun of it comes from... I'm actually not sure where the big fun of it comes from. I think the unison is what, what makes it sound so not solid at this point, because there's no unison on the original version of it. That's just another layer that comes in the layer. Yeah, as you can see, there's no unison going on there. But yeah, that's just on top of it to add like a fifth to it. It's barely noticeable, but it gives it that little bit of an edge. And aside from that, uh, these uh, saw waves are basically going through the entire thing. That was not the sound I wanted to. Was... There's a little bit of gargling going on. That's pitch, uh, pitch LFOs. Really fast, really subtle LFOs on both of these things. This one is so subtle that I'll have to zoom in a lot for you to even see it. Uh, it, it's a bit of a hard style trick. If you want to add some bite to something, just make it go up and down really fast. A really, really tiny bit. But the whole reason why I even have these saw waves in the first place is just like some background elements to it. While everything is going all over the place, it's easy for complex tracks to, to lose definition and to make things sound a little out of place with each other. Uh, you can, of course, use, spend a lot of time on making things fit together uh, arrangement-wise or EQ-wise, and I, of course, did that quite a bit as well. But sometimes just having something play in the background through all of it is what does the trick. There's some uh, delay and reverb, and just a lot of EQing on them as well. 
kids, don't lay reverbs. Don't repeat my mistakes here. <laughs> I'm just really bad at that. Uh, but yeah, aside from that single sound, everything else is just massive patches. It's just massive bases all over the place. What is that? Oh, that that's a single fun sound. I'm, I'll get to that one. But yeah, uh, we have a lot of just the same patches. Uh, the, the stabby stabby bass comes in a few times over and over again. But a lot of it is just the same massive bass, but changed a little bit around. And this one is a different one, by the way. I think I saved the preset from Meteorite and just reused that bass. So a lot of it is pretty much the same as the Meteorite bass. You can see what's going on here. Double notch, all pass. My good old buddies. I'm actually using noise on this one. And then just random patches. Just mess around and see what fits together. Bend plus minus, mess around with that. Uh, Modulate as much as you can. Distort all of it together and dimension expand around it. And you've basically hacked massive at that point. You've figured it out. It might sound different, but it's the exact same fucking patch. It's just got different filters on it. Uh, it's got a band pass instead of an all pass. That's the fun one that does fun things. Uh, again, just different filters. This one's got band reject on it. You can change how a bass sounds a lot just by what filters you're using. And if you want to hear how the whole thing is arranged, I can play it at like half speed and See if I can turn off a lot of the other elements. Let's see if I can do that properly. Here, uh, the arrangement is basically just using a lot of the same basses and making fun rhythms out of them. I'm very much focused on rhythm more than the actual bass patch. That's a fun sound that comes in later on. It's, it's basically just a saw wave from the beginning here, but with four ends on it. Riveting, I know. It's, it's all just tight. <laughs> As you can see, I have a single automation that's just called WUBS. It, it's basically all the different modulations going on in different bases are tied to the same macro key on every massive, and they're all just tied to this single automation. That was fun times. So let's talk about uh, not exactly the bases, but everything else that's happening here. Because there's a lot of elements that make it sound as big and noisy as it does. Oh boy. Sidechain is important, kids. <laughs> so first of all, there's a downlifter on it. That's not tied to anything, which is why you heard it when I solo the the wrong fucking thing i have some crashes going on here let me see if i can find them they're part of this thing here oh cool i can actually show them all at once
So first of all, crashes. My own little uh, fun secret weapon is that this is gonna sound weird, but I put unison on the crashes. The way I do that is that I uh, I have the crash sample here. Sounds weird. It sounds weird like that. It sounds very white noise-ish, but it actually usually sounds like this. A lot more crashy. And what I do is uh, in echo delay slash fat mode, I put the feed at maximum, uh, the pan fully to one side because I have ping pong on, so it moves from uh, one side to the other. I have 10 echoes with a very, very short delay time. Uh, fat mode as well, which means that uh, instead of everything just progressively becoming louder, uh, the volume of things relatively gets changed when you put the feet up at maximum. Just so you don't blow your eardrums out. But yeah, uh, the time here, I, I would show you, but I'm gonna mess up how perfectly I hit it here. I have it at like 0 0.01. Just so everything doesn't play at once, but it's just a little past everything else. And then uh, the pitch here is basically what makes it sound so wide and weird. Uh, because, uh, because it makes the pitches... As you can see here, it makes them spread out on every single echo of it. So some of it goes up in pitch and some of it goes down in pitch. So it sounds like instead of just a single crash, it's practically a choir of crashes and it makes it great for just having in the background so now this one is practically porter robinson again it's a clap that's been time stretched for some apparent reason i don't know why with a lot of reverb on it kind of short but a lot of reverb a little bit of distortion just to make it just to put push it a bit further forward in the mix. Uh, this is just for automating the volume of it. And some EQ. But basically what, what it is, is uh, if you listen to Porter Robinson's and Matt So's Easy, the drop of it, you can hear that there is that exact same kind of... Kind of uh, that exact same kind of like clap with a lot of reverb on it in the background. And this is just kind of replicating that. Uh, those two things, along with everything else, is practically uh, the background stuff that's happening here in the drop. We have a very uh, sustained first part and then a very jumpy second part here. That's kind of a throwback to the original drop. Mostly through it just having the same side chained, the same beep beeps in them, with everything else built around that. There's just so many sounds going on though that you might not even realize that it's the exact same things. And this fun little beep here uh, is just another high-end sound. A little more jumpiness to everything. That's really 2014. <laughs> uh... I could try to explain what's happening here, but it was just a lot of trial and error with uh, with FMing shit and uh, pitch modulate pitch modulation uh, going on here with the slide attack. So instead of it just straight on being like right with that beep, it's a uh, where are my undoes? There they are. Instead, it's it's just with a slight upward motion. Sounds fun that way.
And yeah, after that, it's just a lot of doing the same fun things. Uh, this is practically the exact same part as the first one, except the saw wave to begin with. Again, it's just formant that I'm messing around with. And more subtly, uh, the layer on top of this bass afterwards is not the exact same sound. Uh, it's not this one. Side chained. Fucker. <laughs> It's not that exact one, it's this one. Ooh, it's been raised to an octave instead of a fifth this time around. It's very subtle, I'm not sure people even heard it, but I don't know, I, I like what it adds to it. <laughs> And then here's where fun things start happening. Uh, you might not believe it, but there's only three bases switching between each other right at that point. It sounds like a lot more, but it's just three bases having fun. We have this. Which is uh, a neuro base. Neuro de la Harmor, if I can find it. I don't think it's that one. Yeah, it's not. Uh, where are we even in the clip at this point? I swear I'll find it. Fucking. <laughs> Why is everything you There we go. <laughs> Okay, it's right there, and the base has to be... I swear, I've, I've looked at this FLP before, I know where everything is. Kind of. That's not the sound, I think. But it, it would be easier if... Okay, so that's where that is now. I think I found it here. Yes, I found it, finally. Okay, fuck. So. This one is fun. It started off with practically using all of Seamless's methods. Uh, it's a saw wave to begin with, technically, where I've fucked up the harmonic face of it completely, so it, it's unrecognizable. Uh, then I've detuned it slightly. Uh, I've got Hertz mode on, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, there's a little bit, teeny tiny bit of harmonic unison pitch going on. And I'm just, like, attenuating the fuck out of that. I'm surprised that there's no randomization on it, but... I guess I can get away with that on this one. Uh, it's distorted afterwards, there's a lot of chorus on it. And once again, all the fun stuff is happening here. With this exact pitch on it. And oh my god, I am... <laughs> I'm going multiple rounds on this one. Uh, this exact uh, Maximus, as far as I can tell, is there to remove some low-end weird shit going on. If I didn't have it that on. And I turn off the this thing. You can hear. Or you should be able to normally hear some weird, weird stuff going on in the... I guess I've been really good at cutting it out otherwise, but this is to, to cut out some weird, uh, some weird, like, squeaky sound that usually came whenever, when, whenever I'd release a note. It would be like, <coughs> stuff like that. And it sounded fucking weird. 
be sure to use that for whatever meme you fucking want, by the way. Have fun with it. <laughs> but yeah, I'm distorting it a lot here afterwards. This Maximus is doing its fucking job by uh, just compressing the fuck out of it. I have an OTT that's compressing it even more because apparently I wasn't happy with it. Uh, this kind of modulation really, really screws around with it and makes it super quiet afterwards, so I can imagine that I'd need a lot of fun stuff on it. But yeah, that's just one bass. I'll make sure to find the other fun bass afterwards. Here. I'm sure I'll be able to find it at some point. I'll just scroll to where I have to be. Okay, there's actually four bases. We've got that stabby one coming back in. And then this, this base. That apparently is the base that I uh, pulled in from Meteorite, by the way. You can look at what fun stuff I'm doing here. But again, it's it's the, just the exact same filters, all pass and band pass. And for some odd reason, I'm even uh, automating the mix between those two. I don't know why. But yeah, it's just giving a stab here. Kind of that kind of sound. That's what what's going on. Oh, I think that is the weird sound. <laughs> that sounds so odd. Okay. That was because the sidechain was off. <laughs> I know, right? Uh, the backwards kind of sounding bass here, I've already shown you that one at this point. It's one of the... It's one of the weird ones that I made before, all just copies of the exact same thing, where I messed around with filters a bit. Uh, I've heard people refer to it as a backwards bass, which is weird because it's I haven't recorded or reversed anything in it. It just sounds backwards because uh, it's it goes down after everything. <laughs> I think the whole reason why I decided to just drop the beat out and have that bass kind of carry it over into the next part was because I heard I I heard Volant do that in like his uh, in his version his uh, work in progress version of an astronaut remix I think it was where he basically does the exact same thing but much slower and much more in your face. And I'm, I'm just doing it here to extend it right into the next part and continue the phrase of build up so far, which is simple sound, explosive, uh, stabby saw boy, everything being kind of sustained here, and then jumpy part afterwards. It's, it's, very, it's very much the same throughout a lot of this part. <laughs> The, there is only one bit that's different here to kind of signify that something new is coming without adding just a lot of risers and shit like I did before. That that single do 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 instead of do do do. So again, it's just messing around with things to make them sound interesting. To make them sound interesting, I can grammar. I promise you that. So there we get to the rat twist part. Before we get over there though, uh, throw, my god, I can speak today. I think this is the, this is the extremely simple riser that's going on here. Like, that is deceptively simple. It is 
straight up a uh, a saw wave with a face all the way down here that starts off with no no pitch and no uh, pan on the unison. It might sound like it's very high pitched, but the face here actually makes it uh, interfere in such a way that you hear it an octave higher. Not even an octave higher, like a, just a lot of notes higher. And as you can hear, when I add, when I uh, detune things, everything falls out of phase. But really, that that's not the super interesting part. The super interesting part is the fact that it, it's just a fucking saw wave, and it just distort, not distorts, it just detunes. But that helps in just carrying you over to the next bit. Sometimes you don't need to overthink the things that you put into these things. Sometimes you don't need to add a whole bunch of effects. Sometimes a note can just go upwards and that that's how you fucking build things up. <laughs> and then we get to... I think this is honestly my favorite part. So we've got... Uh, this is actually a l even more layered than the part that came before, even if it sounds a little less in your face. So we have these uh, plugs coming back. But this time, uh, the Low, the low pass is completely off, they're in your face and they're loud and proud and they're cool as fuck. We've got the sub going on there. If you want me to, I can talk about it later, uh, the sub in this, because I actually did some interesting things with it as well. And then we just have bases, bases. This is just... Squelchy, or as they like calling it in here, Skelchy, it seems. That's fucking weird. And this bass might sound like super dirty and shit, but the whole reason why I'm using this instead of some of the other basses is that it's scooped. Uh, so mostly it's just adding in the low mids and in the high mids here. It's making room for everything else that's in top of it. The saw waves, the leads and everything. And also, it sounds fucking terrible when you play too low. That is the sound of your TV vomiting. <laughs> uh, this is extremely quiet for most of the time. Uh, but it comes into play whenever we get to the end of a phrase, because it does this fun thing. You can you can see the automation of it happening whenever we get to the end of like every four bars. As you can hear. It's just to remind you that this is still a complex track. <laughs> And then this. It's just like a really, really, really high pitched uh, high drone, which is again just adding layers to make it all sound cohesive and to make it sound pretty massive. Specifically, uh, adding such a high-pitched drone is something I do more or less no matter uh, what song it is I'm tackling. Because it just... It, I, it's hard to explain. It, <laughs> it adds a level of awe and intensity, as far as I can tell, 
to mo to a lot of the things I'm working on if I turn it off. My computer freaks out. Obviously, it's not a fan of me turning it off. Let's try turning it on. So that just adds a little more extra to it. Experiment with high drones. Uh... You will not get addicted to them, I promise you. Uh, aside from that though, the, the fun thing here is the solo. I fucking love playing the solo in. Or actually, uh, drawing the solo in. I played it first to see if it would work. And then because I was lazy and I didn't want to quantize and shit, I just drew it in afterwards. <laughs> This is a very standard uh, Mune lead, which is just a bunch of really, really simple sounds, uh, really simple wavetables, with some octave stuff going on. And then the fun stuff, where all the fun shit happens, uh, is in the fact that there's unison on it, and then not actually a lot of pitch cut off. I don't think there's any. Yeah, there's not any pitch cut off at all. The actual modulation of what's happening here comes from the vibrato, because Massive is basically set up for Super Sauce. It, it randomizes uh, every single oscillator if you have unison on, and that means it uh, randomizes the start of every single vibrato uh, LFO as well. So when you turn it up like that, you get basically what would happen if you had an entire choir singing perfectly the same tune, but all adding some vibrato to it. So... It's got the washy sound of if you were to uh, detune it, but at the same time it's got the movement of actual vibrato. And I, I do that a lot on my leads. It's such a cool little thing to do. Uh, but yeah, that that's playing a very, very simple melody. Uh, I've got a l layer on top of it that's adding some harmonies. I think it's practically the same thing except with a few... a little bit less layering. Ah, yeah, okay. Uh, so what I did was I had this very saw... saw wave sounding lead to begin with. And then the layer on top of it, the harmony, I do this quite a bit when I have several things playing together. You can hear it most obviously in my Sonder remix. I have another uh, layer on top of it, either playing a counter melody or playing uh, harmonies on top of it. And it's, it's more square wave. It just adds a little bit of extra texture to what's happening. So that that's basically all that's happening. Uh, it's just all playing together at once. I've got a slow riser going on here as well. And now the outro is really really long and really loud because this was the most energetic drop I had ever made and still have ever made like I'm, I'm not about to one up it by the way <laughs> so I really really had a lot of energy that I needed to bring down and the only way I could imagine doing that was by easing out of it by fading things over time. Starting off with 
solidifying everything into one chord, like we did during the first buildup. <laughs> There's still a bit of chord movement going on, but uh, what I'm doing is that the root note, or at least in many of the inversions I'm doing here, the root note stays the same, the sub stays the same. And since a lot of where you get, since, since a lot of uh, the root and the grounding in music comes from the sub and the bass, the fact that that one stays the same makes it sound very much like it's the same chord every time even if it's not actually playing the same thing over and over again side chain <laughs> that sub pattern by, pattern by the way is uh, the same as the jumpy part here <laughs> We've got the beeps as well, somewhere, I think. Yeah, they're down there. So it's practically the exact same thing, except it's not whopping all over the place like it did before. Oh, and we've got the piano as well, because it didn't get enough love before, and I think it fit well here. <laughs> but I'm keeping the layer sound. The super saws are back to being plugs now. And we've stripped out the even the layer elements as well. And then it just ends with an explosion. Again. We start with an explosion, we end with an explosion. The track's called Volcano. I'm a fucking genius. <laughs> uh, we've got that thing coming back, but honestly, I could have just as well left it out because it's completely inaudible among everything else. <laughs> Hell yeah, it's a hot track. But yeah, that was that was basically a rundown of uh, the sound design and the arrangement of Volcano. What went into it, per se. Uh, I could talk about some of the mixing that's going on, but a lot of it would just be me repeating myself over and over again, saying, I put an EQ on it to make it fit in, and then I EQ'd it over time and made it fit in more and more. So I think something a little more fun to look at would be the mastering. By the way, if you guys have any questions along the way, uh, I'll be sure to answer them. If there's something I didn't explain enough, or if there's anything you're interested in when it comes to this track. But hello, Ozone. This is what I use for practically anything mastering related. There's a little bit of EQ going on here to, I, I think I, yeah, I lowered the sub a little bit and I increased the base of it. Not by a lot, obviously. But yeah, in the Ozone, it's practically the, the kind of mastering that I would normally do on anything, except this one was a bit more of a headache because I had two very different drops. And the, I had two ways I could deal with that. I could either have two different mastering chains that kind of swished in and out for the two drops, or I could spend forever on mixing the whole thing. Which, of course, was the dumb choice, 
that would take much longer, so who the hell would make that decision? So that was obviously the decision I made. Uh, there's only one mastering chain on the whole thing. And this is why it takes so long for me to get tracks out. Oh man. So let's go through it. It all starts with... Okay, see ya, a Cosmo tunes. It all starts with a multiband compress compression where I'm just more or less making sure that everything is as loud as it can be without having any sudden peaks in it. Makes it easier to basically slam everything afterwards if you make sure to slam every bit of it first. The whole mentality behind where I place these things is basically just starting with putting them where uh, it peaks and then just messing around with them until it works. Same goes for the attack. This one was the biggest bitch. And I'm not saying that specifically because I remember it being a bitch, I'm saying that because this area is always a bitch, no matter what track I'm working on. And this one's got a very low attack because it was a very dirty track. It was supposed to sound kind of distorted in the high end. And we've got multiband exciting going on here. Uh, unlike its name, it's actually not that exciting to look at. So let's move on to the post equalization. Yeah, I'm I'm using a lot of uh, EQ one. That's simply because I at this time didn't have fruity balance on. Uh, on here. So whenever you see a parametric EQ1, just imagine that it's a fruity balance. I'm using it in the exact same way. It's for volume automation. I'm using it because it's uh, it's really good for going from full signal, which would be 50%, to absolutely no signal. Unlike parametric EQ2, which you where you cannot turn down to completely nothing. And it's also it's an old plugin, so there's no smoothing. So I can use it for sidechain, as you can see here. But yeah, when it comes to the post equalization, uh, the first thing I did was in the side EQ, I split it to mid side. I removed all the low end. Not anymore, it seems. It's, Fruity Balance is not standard anymore with uh, FL11 and 12 and forward. It was with FL10, but after that I've had to import it as a VST, which is weird. But yeah, I, I removed the low end here, and uh, after that it was just a case of messing around with everything until, with this maximizer on as well, Messing around with it until it was as loud as I wanted it to be without distorting anywhere. There was a lot of a being going on with other tracks where I played them on uh, SoundCloud or just Windows Media Player. And just listen to where was my track more accentuated than other tracks? Where could I turn it down without it sounding weird in comparison to other tracks? Because mastering is not just about making tracks loud. Mastering is also about making tracks sound like they fit in with where they're supposed to be played. Which in my case is among a lot of other soundtrack, a, a, lot, a lot of other uh, SoundCloud tracks. I'm good at putting work together today it seems. So that environment was what I shot for. There's a little bit of extra wide on it. And then this thing looks like it's going nuts, but as you can see, at this point, uh, the the signal is really, really quiet. So if I turn it off, that's how quiet it is. Now it's loud. After that, I have, again, a wave shaver doing just a little bit of peak trimming. how it sounds normally. 
this is just for turning it up a little bit afterwards uh, without fucking up the signal too much. Because if I turn it up in Ozone with a maximizer, no matter how short I have it here on uh, this wonderful preset, no matter how short I have it, I would end up with just a little bit of a little bit of like ducking going on here and there from it having some hiccups. Might be intelligent, but it's not genius. So this is kind of brute forcing it instead, pushing it up, just a, a clean signal right until the peaks, where I then round it off a little bit. So th this is kind of analog. Uh, at least it's trying to m to uh, emulate analog in that sense. <laughs> And then this is for just seeing the stereo image of it. As you can see, it's not actually doing anything. Wave candy, I have that right here. It's a fun little thing. It's for if I want to stare at the waveform. <laughs> And then Fruity Vocoder, I get asked about this all the time, and I would show it off here, but it would destroy my computer instantly. But I use Fruity Vocoder uh, as basically in the same way some people would, would use Voxenko Span. And the way that I use it to analyze the low end, I've just found that this vocoder, even though it gobbles up CPU for dinner, it, it sh it's more responsive in the low end than Span is, so I've just gotten used to it. You can hear it already. Sorry for now. Here's how it sounds when I turn it on. It doesn't ever let up. It's wonderful. And by wonderful I mean terrible. Also kind of wonderful. I like it. My god, I, I can smell my computer just smoking right now. Don't worry, it's not actually smoking, I'm just joking around. Yeah, maybe not when it's freaking out so much to begin with, but trust me, uh, it would just sound weird and stupid all the way through, no matter what part of it I play. Like the first part here as well. As you can hear, it's it's having trouble just with that first part. And if I turn it off, suddenly no more problems. Kind of. Close all plugged windows. That should do the trick. But yeah, if there are any other questions about like any elements of this track, uh, you've got about 15 minutes to ask them before I before I'm ending the stream. I haven't talked about the cake at all. There's not all that much interesting about the cake. Uh, I guess one thing I could say about the kick is that I have made sure to pitch it. So it's in key with everything else that's going on. You can see up there that whenever the kick hits on its own, it's still hitting the exact same note as the sub. And that's just because when you're working with something as uh, minimal as this track, you gotta make sure everything fits. So the kick is in pitch, is in key, I mean, this snare is in the exact same key as well. I've messed with the multi multiplying time stretch thing going on there. 
to make sure that's in pitch. And for the kick itself, uh, I did something a little more fun. <coughs> I coughed, apparently. What I did was... Uh, oh, apparently not. Okay. Yeah, okay, I, I just messed with the time stretch as well. What I did before... Okay, that was not that either, but what I usually do is that I have the kick at the original pitch that it comes in at, what I've, the original pitch of what I find it at, and then uh, in the pitch envelope, I turn, off the, I turn on the envelope, uh, mess a bit around with the attack, like stretch it a little bit, that was my phone by the way, it's right beside me, and then I turn the amount down. So instead of uh, this going, what it would do is it would go, and if I turn a sustain up, then it would just it would start at the original pitch and then go down to whatever pitch I wanted to go down on. So let's say I had a kick perfectly at. Okay, that sounds fucking weird. <laughs> let's say I had a kick perfectly at. Uh, I, I use the time multiply instead of the pitch because if I were to use the pitch, it would automatically go to auto auto stretch mode, which is apparently best mode. Thanks for patting yourself on the back, Apple Studio. Don't get too cocky now. Uh, it it would instantly time stretch these things. Uh, it would add algorithms and shit to it, and it would mess around with the sample. When I do stuff like this, I can keep it on resample and. It would just play it at a lower pitch. I'll show you right here. So let's say I turn it down 100 cents. As you can see, it instantly went to auto. Now this both renders multiplication as null. Uh, it's an auto now, so all this does is shorten the whole thing instead of actually shifting it. And you might not hear it all that much here because it's a pretty solid kick. But on other samples, this could very easily just ruin the whole thing. It would ruin the transients, transients of it, and you don't want that. That's not cool. If you if you found a sample that sounds good, you want it to keep sounding good. So <laughs> I think this is the kick I used for this other area as well. Fun enough, I actually haven't uh, tuned the hi-hats, mostly because they're hi-hats. Why do I still have... <laughs> Why do I still have the kick basic in here? It's not playing ever. Why... Why the... Okay. There's a lot of reverb on that one. There's no reverb on that one. The one with reverb is the one that plays in this part. And all the reverb is there simply so simply so it fits in and it adds a little bit more noise to everything. There we have it. So if I were to turn that off, it would sound dry and short. And you would barely notice it in the mix. But the reverb just gives it strength. The reverb is its steroids, apparently.
that's how that thing works. The whole reason why I like using Toxic Biohazard for this is, uh, first of all, because you can put Unison on it very easily and it just sounds good right out the gate. And also because, and this is going to sound weird, I like Toxic Biohazard because it's a really bad plugin. Not bad as in it doesn't get you the results you want, but bad as in it's old. Uh, it doesn't have any... It doesn't really do any oversampling, which makes it really good for making very interesting risers. You can look up the Nyquist limit, limit, Nyquist limit, I promise you I can speak. You can look it up if you want, but practically what's going on is that this thing, when you uh, FM things as hard as I'm doing right now, you end up with frequencies that are techni technically above what the current uh, bitrate can recreate. And because you can't have information in an audio file that's higher than, for example, in this one, I think it's 40, 44 kilohertz or something like that, because you can't have information that's higher than that, uh, what happens is that all of those things, they uh, the pattern that gets created by them, like it, it technically goes down instead. So the more you make things rise up, the more you have things, the more you have these little pitches that start going down and up and down and up and down faster and faster. So you just end up with more interesting sounds right out the gate. Simply because it's a weird ass plugin that doesn't do what it's supposed to. It's fun. <laughs> But either way, uh, instead of continuing this video for a lot longer, if there are no questions, I think I'm just gonna end the recording here. So, for those of you guys, for those of you guys that are on stream right now, I'm not ending the stream right away. Uh, I'm just gonna end the video here. And for you guys on YouTube, uh, thanks for watching all the way through. Oh, so he, there is someone that actually has one more. Go right ahead. How I go about design sounds and armor? Well, it depends on what sound I have in mind. Uh, mostly, I don't really use armor for a lot anymore. I used it a lot in this one, but like uh, when it comes to subs, for example, I just kind of go with like simple, very simple sub. But when it comes to like basses and stuff, I tend to just uh, make whatever I want to make by okay that that first of all that's not the one I wanted to mess around with and second of all sidechain is being a bitch again uh, the way I usually go about designing sounds and armor is not as much having something in mind uh, as it is just messing around with techniques I know already work. So that can be stuff like this pitch thing, making it go down really fast. Doesn't add a lot right now because there's already so much attack to it. And then just messing around with things like the timbre harmonic level and harmonic face to make this sound a little more interesting. Uh, detune things in here, detune things over here, and then just distorting all of it to see what fun sounds I get out of it. A lot of a lot of the times where I open up Harmer is either when I know exactly what it is I want to make, or I know that I want to make something that sounds somewhat neuro-ish. <laughs> it, it's okay. You, you don't have to ask questions. I'm just curious about if people have questions. 
but if I know exactly what it is I want to make, and uh, I know that it can be made in Harmer, for example, the beeps, I just go about making it the same way I would in practically any plugin, which is to just mess around with things that I need to mess around with to get the sound I want. This is nothing more than a square wave with some pitch automation to it. Like that's the simplest sound you could ever make. I, I'm distorting it afterwards, but that does nothing to a square wave right out of the game. And then just a saw wave that's much lower. And that basically gives me the sound that I want. It's much more interesting the way I go about making things in Massive, because in Massive, I just mess around randomly. I have. I don't have the faintest clue what I'm doing <laughs> in this plugin, which is kind of the beauty of it, because I open up Massive when I don't know what sound I want. Or Serum in that case, because I'm so not used to the wavetables in it. Uh, so I just mess around with that and see what I end up with. I do some things... The, I do some things sometimes that I know will work, like adding some white noise to things sometimes. Messing around with face if I want things to have a little more, uh, to sound a little, th to sound a little thinner and have a little more bite to them. Then I mess around with uh, face modulation. But aside from that, it's just a shot in the dark, most of the time. Also, sub. This is going to be the last thing I say before I end the video, by the way. But sub. Don't just do a single sine wave. This is what a single sine wave sounds like. It sounds deep, I know, but I'm personally not a fan of having it that deep. How far back do I have to go to make it be what it was originally? Eh, whatever. I won't save this one. That might not sound like a lot, but if we were to do it like this... You can instantly hear the overtones on it. Uh, some people do this by distorting their yeah, I, I've noticed that now, Atreus. But yeah, uh, overtones are sometimes added uh, by other producers by like distorting their sub afterwards and stuff like that. I like just having the overtones in the original sound, which is why I like making them with Harmer. Also, I can do all kinds of fun pitch envelopes with it because it's, a, it's an FL native plugin. But yeah, like, I would very much recommend, if you're not doing it already, that you mess around with using overtones on your sub. That means that you can have it play more crazy things without having that big, stupid gap between your sub and the lowest part of your mid-range bases. I know there might be some... Like, it's, it sounds modern and everything, and sometimes it works well in Brostep, but in the kind of music I make, I tend to not really be a fan of it. But yeah, I think it's about high time that I end the stream here. This video is already really long, so, <laughs> so if you've watched all the way through to this point, then thank you. Uh, if you have any questions that I haven't answered here, go ahead and leave them in the comments below, and I'll... Do my best to answer as many of them as I can. And yeah, I hope to put out more music soon enough. Uh, I just need to finish some things. I already have at least one track that's very close to done, so we'll see when that comes out. And I hope 
to stream every Friday from here on out. Uh, depends on if I'm busy busy during Fridays, of course. Next time, maybe I'll be working on some music. Maybe I'll be taking uh, viewer tracks and reviewing them. I'll find out uh, throughout the week. Eight, 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 eight. Very much eight. <laughs> but yeah, I'll I'll see you guys next time.